How do we know what life on Earth looked like in the ancient past? What is your picture of how large dinosaurs lived and died? For centuries, paleontologists have been piecing together evidence of ancient life to answer this question. Fossils, mineral deposits, and other clues from the past continue to reveal new facts about the large dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago. Join us for a conversation with paleontologist and director for the National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Kirk Johnson, to learn what happened when the large dinosaurs went extinct. Now, here's your host, Maggie Benson. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Maggie Benson, host of Live from Curious, Smithsonian Science How. We're really excited to be back for a brand new season of Science How, and next week is National Fossil Day, so we're even more excited to bring this show to you today about paleontology. With us now is Dr. Kirk Johnson, director of Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History and paleontologist. Thank you for joining us, Kirk. Thanks, Maggie. So you're the director of the museum, but you're also a paleontologist. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you do here? I've worked my whole life in museums. I'm a fossil-finding paleontologist, and after a while, you become a director. So I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so as a paleontologist, what kind of things do you do to problem solve? You're constantly asking questions as a scientist, I know. Exactly, and I'm a paleobotanist. I study fossil plants, and the paleontology is a, a science that takes you back into time in the ancient lost worlds. And worlds are complicated places, so we collaborate with all sorts of people, other kinds of paleontologists and other kinds of scientists and geologists and other kinds of people that operate the logistics of field trips. So I spend a lot of time digging out in deserts and working in large groups. So you have to think of questions and then search for evidence to support them. And I know one of the mysteries that you've worked on with your teams is the mystery of the dinosaur extinction. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It's a, it's a great mystery. What caused the disappearance of the dinosaurs? And these are amazing animals. Every kid knows dinosaurs. Dinosaurs aren't with us today, except for the birds, of course. But they disappeared. And nobody really knew why until there was an idea proposed in 1980 that an asteroid struck the planet. And that struck me as such a strange idea when it happened, when, when it was proposed, that I said, I gotta check into this and see if I can figure out some scientific ways to test this idea. Interesting. So when you said the large dinosaurs went extinct, we're talking about some of these dinosaurs that are here on the table oh, with yeah. us today. We've got the great big duck-billed Edmontosaurus, and here's the skull yeah. of little baby Triceratops. Here's the tooth of the biggest meat eater of all times, Tyrannosaurus rex. That's just one tooth. That's huge. Yeah. It's the size of a banana. And a little bit more dangerous than a banana. <laughs> <laughs> so these look like some marine fossils. Um, are, did some marine animals go extinct as well? That was kind of the interesting thing was it wasn't just the dinosaurs on land, but in sea we lost the marine lizards, things like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, but also these beautiful coiled shelled animals called ammonites. And here's one from the Dakotas an animal that, who would have had a, an octopus or squid-like animal coming out of the end. And these guys went extinct as well. So something happened that knocked off the big animals on land and a lot of the big stuff in the oceans as well. Interesting. So I think this is a great time to ask our viewers what they think caused the extinction of the great dinosaurs. What do you say? Let's give it a shot. All right. So this is your turn to tell us what you think. What caused the extinction of the large dinosaurs? Was it huge lava flows, sea level changes, asteroid hitting Earth, or diseases? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. This is the same location that you can enter questions for Dr. Kirk Johnson to answer during our live program today. So Kirk, the results are coming in, and so far we're at 83% of our viewers think it's an asteroid impact. What do you think? Well, we didn't give them any other alternatives also, so <laughs> there's one thing. You know, when the idea came up, people thought, boy, asteroids are pretty strange. You imagine an asteroid striking around our space. And at the time, we didn't even realize that big asteroids did hit the Earth. We thought that somehow our atmosphere ate them up. So there are other ideas as well. There are ideas that maybe a volcanic eruption, a really big one, could cause an extinction. Or, Why would they think a volcanic eruption? Well, you know, there are some really big volcanic eruptions that have happened in the past. And when volcanoes erupt, they lay out this 
hot liquid rock that hardens and becomes lava. So there are certain places in the world, like Western India, where there are huge deposits of lava that are more or less the same age as the extinction of the dinosaurs. So you have this great big huge lava flow about the time dinosaurs disappeared. Some people thought that was a pretty good idea for why dinosaurs might have got extinct as well. So what evidence did you find that showed that it may not have been volcanoes? So the original idea was that at the, uh, in 1980, there was a discovery of a thin little layer of clay that contained a high levels of this metal called iridium. It's related to platinum, which is related to the, some of the heavier, more precious metals. And iridium is quite common in asteroids and meteorites. It's quite common in the center of the Earth, but it's rare on the surface of the Earth. So to find iridium at the surface suggested maybe an explosion of an asteroid blew iridium dust around the world. And so would that be enough to be able to say that it was an asteroid impact, or did you have to find more evidence? It was a good idea, but it wasn't unique to asteroids. It turns out that you can get some iridium out of volcanic eruptions. So there were two groups arguing back and forth, or asteroid, volcano. But then there was a discovery of these little tiny grains of quartz and other minerals that had their crystalline uh, core quite shattered and skewed. And they're called shocked mineral grains. And those grains are not found in volcanoes, but they are found in asteroid impact sites and in nuclear test sites. So you have this shocked quartz and you have the iridium found together mm -hmm. in this location. Is that enough to be able to say an asteroid impact caused it? It starts to get to be pretty good. I can remember back in 1988 when we, when we realized the shocked quartz was part of the picture and a lot of the scientific community said, okay, that for us is good enough. It's, it's not the volcano, it's the asteroid. So did you find this in one location or did you find these two things together, the iridium and the shock quartz in other places around the globe? So initially just a few spots, but that was what we call a testable hypothesis. We could go out and look at the layers of rock that were above the last dinosaurs and search to find those layers. And I, I did that immediately because I had been looking at those age rocks for fossils for other reasons. I said, I can actually test this idea and I'll go out and look for this layer. And first season out, I found it. I was amazing. I actually found the layer, I shipped it off for analysis and it came back with high iridium and high shock quartz. Right where I was looking, I was like, that's pretty interesting because I wasn't convinced and I went out independently and tested that hypothesis. And you came back with an actual piece that had that evidence right there yeah, inside it. You know, and I've got a chunk right here. And this layer, it looks like almost nothing, right? It's just a little lump of rock. It's about as thick as my finger. But take a look really closely. And if you look closely, you can see about the size of little ballpoint pen tips. Absolutely. A little round balls. And those things are what are left from droplets of melted target rock that was sprayed across the world. So if, imagine this, the asteroid strikes, strikes in Mexico and it blows molten rock up into the sky, which as it flies through the air, cools into little balls, little glass balls that rain down on the landscape thousands of miles away. Thousands this, of miles away. This rock was found in North Dakota. So these are little glass balls that were blown from Mexico to North Dakota on one day, 66 million years ago. That's incredible. So this layer is actually representative of this moment in time when this asteroid impacted Earth. And you can find this all over the world. Exactly. So if you are below this layer, you're in the time of dinosaurs. And you can collect fossils and rebuild their world. And if you're above the layer, you're after the time of dinosaurs. And you can see what happened after the extinction. So my question is, how did everybody, how did the scientific community land on the asteroid impact hypothesis? What was the smoking gun? Well, you know, the idea was based when, they, when researchers actually found this layer of iridium and they proposed the idea. And then that's the way science works is everybody tries to disprove it. We're all like, that can't be possibly true. And we went out to try and disprove it. And in the act of disproving it, we found more evidence for it. So once we started doing that, I was like, wow, this is actually might be true. There might actually be evidence. But we would like to find to be sure, the actual crater. Because we had found the evidence of the debris that was blown out of the crater, but we didn't actually found the crater itself. So did you ever find the crater? It, it came after a decade of search and, and uh, people were looking for it. And remember, there's lots of places where you can hide a crater. It could be at the bottom of the ocean. It could be in an area where the, there's lots of vegetation and you don't see it. But it turns out that one very persistent scientist found the crater in Mexico. Wow, that's probably huge. It's a vast crater. It's 120 miles wide. Wow. And it's filled in. So all you, can, you can't really see much of the surface now, but if you use various tools that we use for searching for oil and project sound beams down into the ground, you can actually see this great big round crater 
that's over 120 miles wide. Wow, that's huge. So with all the evidence of the iridium, the shock quartz, and this crater, then it has to be an asteroid. Well, at least we know an asteroid hit, and we know it hit when the dinosaurs went extinct. But remember those, the volcanoes are still erupting over in India too. So did the asteroid cause the extinction of the dinosaurs is still a pretty interesting question. So I understand that you do a lot of work in the Hell Creek Formation in North mm -hmm. Dakota. Why is that a good location to study this question? Well, if you, if you actually want to study a question like what happened to the dinosaurs, you have to find a place today that has fossils from that time exposed at the surface. And you want a place where there's not too much modern vegetation because you want to be able to look at the rock and find the fossils. And North Dakota, Montana, South Dakota have lots of beautiful places called Badlands, which are rounded hills of muddy rock where there's not much vegetation growing. And you can walk around and just pick up little fossil bones and dig in and find little fossils. And they're fossil exposed. Leaves. Oh, yeah. And you walk it along, you'll find something like this in the ground. And what this is, is a dinosaur toe. <laughs> That's just a toe right there. That's just there. a toe. And it may have been laying out on the sand. Wouldn't it be cool to walk along and find a toe? <laughs> that would be very cool, <laughs> And yes. the way you do that is you go to a place where the rocks are the right age, there's not a lot of vegetation, and you just start looking. And you'd be amazed what you find. Very cool. So do you have time uh, to answer a question? Of course. All right. This one comes from Jack from L.A. Jack wants to know, how could an asteroid make things all over the world go extinct? Jack, that's a really good question because, uh, you know, the question is how big was the asteroid? And remember, last um, two years ago, there was a giant uh, meteor that came into Russia. And it was about the size of a bus, and it blew up, and it blew out a bunch of windows, but it didn't even kill that many things. And the question is, how big would an asteroid have to be that it actually would be a problem? And it looks like the one at the end of the Cretaceous was six miles in diameter, and it was moving about 20 times the speed of a rifle bullet. So when it hit, it made a big big explosion. It made a huge hole, caused gigantic earthquakes, huge tsunamis. The explosion blasted heated gas. Chunks of the stuff that was blown out of the crater blew up into low Earth orbit and rained back through the Earth's atmosphere and heated up on the way in, creating a broiler oven in the sky, which lit forest fires. And you had dust that blocked the sunlight out for four months. And those are a lot of different killing mechanisms. Like, you wouldn't really want to be there the day that thing hit, because if you were within 2,000 miles of it, you'd be incinerated and exploded. But if you're on the other side of the planet, it would still be dark, you'd still have forest fires, you'd still have a lot of problems that would make it very difficult to stay alive. It was a bad day on Earth. A very bad day. Maybe the worst day on Earth that we know about, actually. So we have another question um, that is kind of pertaining to this that we can do quickly. How do you know how the crater in Mexico is the one that caused the dinosaur extinction? <sighs> Simply by dating, or is there other evidence? Excellent question. So the way the guy found the crater was he looked where the largest beads of glass that were blown out of the crater were located. He made a map of where those beads were, and he plotted the map and he said, well, somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico ought to be the crater. When he found the crater, then it was a matter of dating the melted rock in the crater and getting a, a date from uranium lead, which is a type of radiometric dating of the actual crater, which is about 66 million years old, and dating it with the ejecta layer. He had the same age of the debris and the crater, basically fingerprinting. And one further thing happened. They actually had pieces of the bedrock from the crater they found at the KT boundary layer in Colorado. Wow, that's incredible. So they incredible. actually fingerprint right back to the target rock. And you need special lab tests to be able to oh, do that. Oh, yeah. You need spe this is the whole point about having lots of different scientists working is that in the KT boundary, the study of this extinction, was the first real time that paleontologists realized that they were studying ancient worlds. They needed all the scientists that we work in the world. So physicists and chemists and geophysicists, all sorts of scientists work together on this problem to solve this very complex So we've situation. talked a little bit about the dinosaur extinction, mm -hmm. but I mean, I... I'm a vegetarian. I eat a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. What happened to the plants? Well, I happen to be a paleobotanist, and I study fossil plants. And so my idea was, if you really want to understand what happened to the world when an asteroid hit, you should study the plants, not the animals. Because plants are really common. Just think about it. Go for a walk in the woods, and what do you see? Plants. Plants. Trees, They're everywhere. shrubs. I once cut a tree down and counted the number of leaves on it just to see how many there were. <laughs> how long did that take? It took me 16 hours with one friend. <laughs> And we got 99,284 <laughs> leaves. And what you realize is that, that leaves are pretty great as potential fossils. You take a, a leaf, it falls off a tree like this. And um, this leaf 
falls into the sand in a river, it gets buried. The sand eventually gets buried even deeper, turns into sandstone. The leaf rots away, and when you hit this rock with a hammer, there's a, a weakness in the rock, the shape of the leaf, and it pops right open where the leaf was. Does that mean you get two fossils? Exactly, the part and the counterpart, or the front and the back, or two for the price of one. Wonderful. Isn't that amazing? It's just a beautiful leaf. It's 66 million years old. This is a leaf of a tree that was growing around Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. So we're looking at a leaf right now, but there are a lot of other parts to plants. I mean, there are stems, there's pollen. I mean, what else can you look at to help you be able to piece this together? Yeah, just think about it. I mean, you get the fossilized trunks that tell you how big the forest was, how tall the trees were, but pollen, pollen grains are amazing. They're like one tenth to one hundredth of a millimeter in diameter. And a little tiny chip of mud, if you dissolve it in acid, you can get 10,000 pollen grains. And you can look at them and say, oh, that one is from this kind of tree and that one's from a different kind of tree. You can literally rebuild the forest from a chip of mud. That's incredible. So are you looking at all of these plants before um, this KT boundary? So when these dinosaurs roam the earth to be able to piece together what these ecosystems look like? That's just it. We'll dig a hole in the ground. We'll find five or 600 leaves. We'll reconstruct the world in that spot in that time. We'll go up the hill and get closer to the KT boundary, do it again, go up, get closer. And we basically look at how the forest changed up to and across the KT boundary or before and after. The dinosaur extinction. Exactly. So we've looked at some plant fossils here. We're looking at some animal fossils. Um, I would love to know which fossils are most helpful in recreating these ancient ecosystems. Well, maybe we should ask the people that are watching in right now. I think that's a great idea. Fire it up. All right, so we have another poll available to you on the screen. Tell us which fossil fossils are useful for recreating what an ecosystem looked like. Insects, small mammals, plants, reptiles, or all of the above. Take a moment to think about it and put, it, put your answer in the window located to the right of your video screen. Kirk, I think we have some very smart students out there. What did we get? All of the above is the most popular answer by far. I would have picked that one too. Even though I lean towards plants, it really wants to be an analysis of everything. If you want to know the whole world, look at the whole world. So plants are just the perfect specimen to look at to be able to understand the forest, but you really need all of these other animal fossils to be able to recreate that right. whole ecosystem. And one of the things that was kind of funny is that I used to think that, that these fossil leaves when they had holes in them weren't very good fossils until I realized that these holes are made by insects when the plant was alive and growing and that the fossil actually even contains information about which insects were feeding on it. And we can even look at insects before and after the dinosaur extinction and ask the question, what happened to the insects? So the leaves give you more than just the story of what the forest looked like. It tells you about other animals that live in the forest. Well, that's even interesting that you say before you didn't know that it was insect damage. So mm. are the depictions of these ancient, ancient landscapes actually evolving with the more um, knowledge that scientists obtain and the more evidence that's found? Oh yeah, I mean, one of the things we, we know for a fact is that people love dinosaurs so much that when they make paintings of dinosaurs or movies of dinosaurs, they don't care about anything else. Think about <laughs> Jurassic Park. They put a whole bunch of dinosaurs in Hawaii. Right? <laughs> Jurassic Park was in Hawaii. Well, Hawaii is today. It's not 66 million years ago. And if you look at most dinosaur paintings, you'll find that they have lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs and not a whole lot of anything else. It's not uncommon in a dinosaur painting to see just a dinosaur standing out there in a flat field with nothing in it. <laughs> So somebody yeah. wanted to draw a Tyrannosaurus rex, not the trees that it lived amongst. People love Tyrannosaurus rex. I get that, but <laughs> I like the world that Tyrannosaurus rex lived in. And you look at this image that we're showing you right now, you can see there's a big, beautiful dinosaur right in the middle, and then he's standing in a big field of dirt. I think the world is more interested in that big peel, field of dirt. So what are you and your colleagues doing to be able to help people like me and like the visitors here mm -hmm. at the Smithsonian to better understand what those landscapes of the dinosaurs looked like? Well, we get scientists working with artists. 
because we can collect the data. We know what the trees look like by all the leaves and the trunks and the pollen grains. We know what animals are there because all the bones. We know what insects were there. So we can take all those pieces and put them back together again and create a picture of what it looked like and we'll work with artists to paint that image. Sounds like the artist is just as important as the scientist. Absolutely. I mean, art, art and science, in my mind, are pretty close endeavors. They both involve curiosity and creativity. So there's an artist here at the Smithsonian that's been putting together a wonderful mural of your location, mm -hmm. actually, in North Dakota. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we've been working with Mary Parrish, and the whole team was working with it. We took the team out to North Dakota, we collected the fossils, we brought them all back, and we started to rebuild the world of North Dakota before the asteroid struck. And it's pretty cool. Here's the image. You can see it's got a lot of different things going on. There's a little stream and some floating aquatic plants. This is very exciting. I feel like I'm looking in a window to the past 66 million years ago. Well, you are. And you'll, everything in that painting is based on a real fossil. That's the cool thing about it. So I saw a lot of dinosaurs. Were there that many dinosaurs around when I just would look out my window? Or what's the story? See, if you go for a walk in the woods, chances are that you might see a chipmunk or a bird or something like that. But you don't usually see a cougar fighting a bear next to a giant <laughs> elk and a moose nearby. Animals are sort of rare and they walk by. So this painting that we did is more like a time-lapse photograph. The scene is exactly as you see it. But this would be sort of all the animals that would pass by in the course of a day. And it's almost like uh, you just left your camera open and watched the animals walk through and snapped them as they came through. So you've been able to coordinate all of these teams to be able to go to Hell Creek to create these mm -hmm. fossils, to be able to put together this story for the museum visitors back here in DC. Um, that most certainly relates to your role as director. Well, it is, if you think about what a museum does, it does scientific research. We do research in a lot of areas, not just in paleontology, but also all aspects of biology and anthropology. And we work in big teams, and then our product are the collections that we make and store on behalf of the people. And then we make exhibits and educational programs. So this whole idea of doing science, making collections, sharing the information is what a museum does. It's just a big blown up version of what we've been talking about. And we get to look at all areas of natural history, not just paleontology or exactly, botany. Exactly, because the world is an amazing place. It is. So we have a question. Are you ready for it? I think so. So this question comes from Sand Hill Academy. Are there places in the Hell Creek Formation where small groups can help at a dig site? Ooh, that's interesting, yes. You know, it turns out the Hell Creek stretches over broad segments of eastern Montana, western North Dakota, northwestern South Dakota, and even into Wyoming. And there are a number of different small museums in that area and a number of places that lead field trips into the Dakotas. So that's the kind of landscape that if your school wants to go out there, get online, type in Hell Creek Formation and see what pops up. And there's various opportunities. And also, all over the American West, there are really cool places to go see fossils. There's places like Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado or Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta. Uh, lots of places where fossils have been found and are on display and people can go and participate in various aspects of the digging. And I'll tell you what, it's fun. <laughs> I wanna go. Well, <laughs> we can arrange that. <laughs> all right, this question comes from George. George wants to know, how did you become a museum director? You know, the thing is that I started hanging out in museums when I was a kid. And I, I think I first met my first museum creator when I was 12. And I just showed up and started volunteering, saying, what can I do to help out here? And after a while, I was like, this is a cool place. There's really interesting people. There's really interesting stuff. People come here. People feel really good in museums. And um, so I met a guy who was a museum director. I said, I want to be like that guy. One day I want to be like that guy. So you always wanted to be a museum director. Strangely enough, that is true. So now you're in your dream job. I am. So it sounds like we should be volunteering at dig sites and going to our local museums to learn more about this kind it's of. A, it's a good place to start, that's for sure. <laughs> so this one comes from Brian. Is this the biggest extinction there's ever been on Earth? So that's a really good question, Brian. There have been a number of mass extinctions on Earth and this is probably the second largest, although there's some people that argue it's the largest. The one that is a contender is the one that happened 252 million years ago called the Permian-Triassic extinction. There are other ones as well. So one of the big questions we ask ourselves regularly as scientists is what causes mass extinctions? Maybe the Cretaceous tertiary one was caused by an asteroid, but did asteroids cause them all? Or were there other reasons? So it's a really good series of questions. Great. So this question comes from Susie. Susie, it says, if everything on Earth was killed by the asteroid, how did 
the earth get repopulated and why didn't dinosaurs repopulate? Mm. So Susie's a good point. And the fact is that not everything did get killed. In fact, there's two kinds of killing. There's the killing of individual animals and plants. And if you kill every single animal or plant in a species, you cause that species to go extinct. And we have a lot of species extinction and a lot of mass death, but the fact is that lots of individuals did survive, and as a result, certain species didn't go extinct. And it's those species, the survivors, that lived on to populate the world, and everything that lives on the planet today is a descendant of one of those survivors. So we've got at our table things like turtles, crocodiles, birds, mammals, and you're listening to a couple of mammals here tell you this story. So we have another question. This one comes from Taylor, and I think Taylor is a Jurassic Park fan, which I'm sure yeah. there are many of them out there. Is it possible to bring back dinosaurs using DNA that's possibly trapped in amber or some other kind of fossil? Like everybody else, I love the concept <laughs> of Jurassic Park, the idea that you could actually bring back live dinosaurs. And at the time Jurassic Park first came out, we didn't really know what was possible with DNA or with there, even if there was real dinosaur DNA. And right now, it, we have not been able to actually find any good dinosaur DNA. It looks like DNA does fossilize, but the fossils that have DNA don't go back much further than a couple hundred thousand years. And dinosaurs are 66 million years. And DNA is a kind of a delicate molecule, and it kind of breaks apart over time and with acidic conditions and being exposed to oxygen. So I'm not optimistic that we'll get dinosaurs back from dinosaur DNA. So Mary has a question about mm -hmm. your experience with fossils. How old were you when you found your first fossil and what was it? Ah, uh, yes, I found my first fossil on a family picnic in Casper, Wyoming when I was about five years old. And I walked over to this rock and there was a little tiny fossil brachiopod. That, and I thought it was a fossil of a rattlesnake's rattle because I was really interested in rattlesnakes too. It was just a little brachiopod. But then the next time we went for a hike, I kept looking and I found another fossil. And once I found two, I realized that you can find these things. And it's pretty cool because if you're a kid and you have the superpower of finding things, then you go crazy. And I went to the library, I went to the museums, and I learned how to find more fossils. And every time I go out anywhere, I'd find fossils. And pretty soon I was that kid that could find fossils. Very cool. So I guess you didn't need any special training and you could still find them. Yeah, you're close to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another question. Is there any kind of fossil record of dinosaurs or any other fossils around the crater? The crater is in Mexico, and the crater hit in shallow seawater conditions. There was probably like 600 feet of salt water. So dinosaurs didn't live in the seas, they lived on land. And the nearest land to the dinosaurs would have been somewhere in Texas. And we do in fact find dinosaur fossils in Texas, up in West Texas, and um, in Big Bend National Park, for instance. So the closest place we could find fossils, we do find fossils of dinosaurs to the crater. Kirk, can you tell our viewers where they can learn a little bit more about your work? Sure. I mean, if you're in Washington, D.C., on November 25th, we're opening a new exhibit here called The Last American Dinosaur, right about these very animals. If you're not in Washington, D.C., check out our webpage for references and resources, or go to your local museum. Thank you so much, Kirk. You bet. Thanks again for joining us today on Smithsonian Science How. If you missed part of this program, it'll be archived later today on curious.si.edu. Make sure to join us next time on Smithsonian Science How when we explore island ecosystems with Dr. Tori Rick. Thanks for watching. You can explore more Smithsonian Science How shows on our website, curious.si.edu. We hope you'll join us again on Thursday, November 6th for a conversation with archaeologist Torben Rick, where we'll explore how Native Americans and other humans have influenced island biodiversity over time. Register now at curious.si.edu.